We left off talking um, talking about Euclid versus Ambler, the Supreme Court decision in 1926 that established the constitutionality of land use regulation, zoning, in the United States. And um, the last comment that I said as people were leaving the door, uh, two points I want to make. The court will not disaggregate pull apart the specific provisions of this law, but we will consider the zoning ordinance as a single body of law. Um, in other words, um, a case that, that, that is now probably eight, ten years old, but which is more recent that you may have heard of, the Supreme Court decision in the affirmative action cases at the University of Michigan on their admissions policies where they pulled the cases apart and considered them as two separate cases, considering the undergraduate admissions policy of the university as one set of issues, and then um, the law school admissions policy as another set of issues, in which case they ruled that the, um, the university undergraduate admissions, in fact, was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, but that the law school admissions policy was not, right? Um, they pulled them apart. In this case, they considered it as one thing. And um, then finally, the, the second is that, um, and this is very typical of, of, uh, of Supreme Court decisions. Um, they are loath, the courts are loath to substitute their judgment for that of the legally constituted legis legislative and executive branches of government as to the specifics of the law's provisions. The, the court's role is to determine whether these laws, either in their provisions or in the way that they um, are applied, uh, violates uh, the federal constitution. The, uh, it is not their decision to sort of say, well, we think U1 should have really been U2, or that the height limit should have been 38 feet, not 36 feet. You follow me? They, they, don't, they, they don't like to substitute their judgment for that. And that became important in this particular case um, because they said, we're not going to get into the specifics of this. What we are going to do is to consider this as whether or not it is, in fact, um, a violation of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments arising under the Due Process Clause of the Constitution as applied to the exercise of the flexible powers of police with which we are here concerned. And they reversed the decision of the lower court, uh, in this case the Supreme Court of the State of Ohio, um, and upheld the legality of zoning uh, for the village of Euclid. Um, and I think the, um, it was actually then found to be um, a legal and valid exercise of constitutional police power. Now, um, th this is just something I put together from my own curiosity and then thought that it might be useful in the context of this course, since we're talking about urban form, how cities developed, looking at Euclid and Cleveland uh, which is on the south shore of Lake Erie, um, one of the Great Lakes. Uh, and we see these blue wagon roads. The um, shoreline here is black. This would have been, let's say, 1785 at the time of the passage of the land ordinance, which subdivided all of the territory uh, west of the Ohio River up into uh, township and range. Uh, with 160-acre quarter sections and 40-acre, um, I guess those would be um, quarter of a quarter section, whatever that is, a quarter of a quarter, uh, 40 acres. Um, the section, of course, being um, one square mile, an array six by six sections would equal a political jurisdiction called a township. And then um, we see here the Nickel Plate or the Lakeshore Railroad coming through, and then the Nickel Plate Railroad uh, comes through here. 
And then we see the parcels here that were owned by the Ambler Realty Company that were under scrutiny in this case. And then the interstate is put in paralleling the rail lines. It's often the case that the interstate highways, when they were built in the 1950s and 60s, paralleled railroad lines for a variety of reasons. So there you actually see an aerial of this uh, with the 160-acre quarter section uh, that you see um, um, here, and then the interstate highways and the two railroads, all right? Now, the courts, the, the Supreme Court has a history um, in a decision like this where new law is being made uh, through, the, through the decision. Uh, in this case, the new law being zoning. Um, of opening up the window and then uh, sort of closing it back down but leaving a little crack, meaning we're going to rule uh, the penumbra, the shadow of, of uh, our decision will be wide and far-reaching, but actually the scope of the decision has a little crack. And what they're doing is inviting a second case to come in, and they're sort of, uh, it's a tacit admission that uh, this maybe wasn't the best test case, that there were still issues to be debated and resolved. And uh, they have a history of doing that. They've done that with all sorts of legislation. Um, and this is a case where they did that. And a second case appeared before them in 1928, which is called Necto versus the City of Cambridge. Uh, now, Cambridge, Massachusetts, being part of New England, um, is under a sort of very different structure than, than we are here or the rest of the United States is. Um, so there are terms in this case which may be unfamiliar to you, like um, the master. Um, they have a, in their legal, state legal processes, they have something which, uh, even before the courts, which resembles arbitration. And by that I mean that the court will appoint a master uh, to sort of um, do research on a finding of fact and then make a recommendation to the court. Okay? So it's a little bit different where the judges themselves are actually getting a, a sort of a brief from an appointed individual who has researched uh, all of the facts in the case. Um, this particular case, the Necto case, actually then closed that window back down a little bit, uh, actually substantially. Um, we used to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so actually when I was studying this case, I was able to go and look at this particular parcel, although I don't have any photographs of it. Um, it was, um, this is MIT that we see right here, and a railroad track coming in here, and this is a kind of an industrial area that we see here that includes the New England Confectionery Company uh, that make wafers called Necco, N-E-C-C-O, Necco wafers. You ever seen this candy? Necco wafers. Um, and they still tell stories there about the day in 1896 when the Necco factory exploded. It was during a snowstorm, and all this chocolate went up and mixed in with the storm clouds, and it snowed chocolate. And uh, so you can imagine all the children who were excited about not having to go to school or something that particular day had a double delight because it was actually raining chocolate flakes. You can imagine, uh, really be great, right? Um, well, what had happened is that the city of Cambridge had passed a zoning ordinance in which uh, to the left of um, um, Brookline Street here on the map, was all residential, and everything between here and the railroad tracks was sort of industrial, including the Neco factory, which was a little further up. And the city then zoned this industrial and zoned this residential. The um, Mr. Necto owned a garage. He was a mechanic, and he um, worked on automobiles in the early days of automobiles, 19, the 1920s. Uh, and so he had a whole lot of uh, he had a whole lot of uh, 
junked cars hanging around on his lot, that he would pirate those, the, the, these old broken down cars for parts that might still be good, right? Uh, the engine on a particular car might be no good, but the radiator might still be good. And so he would pull the radiator out of a car and so forth. And the city uh, zoned this parcel that was owned by Necto part residential, you see here, and zoned part of this uh, as uh, for commercial uses. And uh, Necto sued, um, saying that, in effect, um, uh, this was a taking of his property, that he needed the whole thing for the operation of his garage, and thus it was taking away value, uh, basically the same argument that Ambler made uh, in the Euclid case. Uh, the court, this is actually commercial and residential. I got it backwards. I'm sorry. Uh, the court, citing, um, citing the um, Euclid case, ruled in favor. This is the state court. This is uh, Massachusetts court. Ruled in favor of the city of Cambridge. That in in effect it was. Uh, um, Citing here um, the character is that considered by this court in the Euclid versus Ambler, uh, in its general scope, it is conceded to be constitutional within that decision. So this is the Supreme Court case. This is the majority opinion uh, that you're reading, and um, you will see that um, actually here they are citing uh, they are citing uh, their earlier decision in Euclid. And they're saying that uh, in the Euclid case, the court left open the possibility that a specific application of the law could be an invalid use of police power, uh, and thus a violation of Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, so Necto lost in the lower court and appealed, and it went to the Supreme Court in 1928. And that's what you're looking at here. The um, long and short of this is the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the lower court, um, saying, in effect, that um, while the intent of the law was not to be a violation of the Fifth and the Fourteenth, that actually they had followed the protocols of the enabling statutes, et cetera, et cetera, just as the, the village of Euclid had, has, had done. But in the specific application of the law where this particular piece of property here in red was zoned two different things, it was a violation of uh, the 5th and the 14th that it denied Necto his due process rights. Now, um, to take this further, and this is not in the comment, this is my commentary. Um, in effect, what the zoning ordinance did was to create a de facto subdivision, right? It zoned one parcel of land, two different things with a line drawn down the middle of the property, saying that, in fact, one side could be used for commercial and the other side for residential. Um, I was involved in a zoning case back in 1983 where um, it got built. It's, it was a condominium, two identical apartment buildings, owner-occupied, so condominium. And um, it's on North Highland Avenue uh, near the uh, Aurora, I think it's Aurora Coffee Company. It's not Aurora. It's DBA Barbecue. You know where that is. Um, and uh, it was a very strange parcel of land with 110 feet of frontage on North Highland, um, adjacent to commercial property on one side and a photographer's studio on the other, even though the photographer's studio had been built as a single-family residence. It had been converted into commercial use uh, Lee Photography. Um, the, uh, the city had zoned the front half of the parcel 
commercial and the back half of the parcel residential. Um, I was familiar, of course, with the Necto case, and uh, we went before the Zoning Review Board where we were defeated about 368 to nothing. I mean, people had, you know, our pictures on buttons with X's through them, things like that, right? Um, foaming at the mouth. Um, and we were, we were just slam dunked. I mean, we were, it was a unanimous decision by the Citizen Advisory Board uh, to deny the rezoning. Well, I was familiar with this case, so I looked it up, and I took it to the attorney who was representing uh, my client. And I said, you might want to read this case and then have a conversation, have lunch with the uh, city attorney because if you want to take this to court, we will win. You cannot zone one parcel two different things. Simply put, right? can't do it. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a de facto subdivision. It is not land use. And um, that was the issue here, and the judgment was of the lower court was reversed, and Necto uh, was able, in fact, uh, with compensatory damages uh, paid by the city, was able to maintain his uh, his garage, his use of uh, his use of uh, of, of, the, of the property. Um, okay, so there are remember two different issues. One is the regulation of private property here, zoning, and the other is the City Planning Enabling Act, uh, which came along in 1928, which in fact controls the subdivision of land, uh, the, taking undifferentiated territory and subdividing it up into streets and blocks and lots with parks and public spaces and public buildings and other kinds of things like that. And as we will see, the area that we're in right here was originally a private subdivision. Most American cities were built that way, where a landowner uh, subdivides the land and then sells off uh, improved lots. Uh, to this day, that is basically how subdivision developers still operate. There may be a few companies, large companies, national companies, uh, but it's a very small percentage of the total single-family residential development in the United States. Um, it's less than 10 percent. Ninety percent of all single-family housing um, is actually built by people who build fewer than 10 houses per year. And typically what they will do is purchase the lot, the improved lot, from the subdivision builder. So the subdivider is putting in improved streets, running utilities, sewer connection, water, um, and his or her product is in fact, that, that is sold on the market, in the marketplace, is in fact the improved lot. Um, in some cases, uh, Back Bay in Boston, uh, the city itself acted as the developer with the state fronting the money for the construction, if you recall, of the Charles Street um, bulkhead and the construction of, um, of um, the public gardens in which then the, the, the proceeds, the revenue, and then the second one, which was the B, there's Arlington Street, and then the B Street, uh, Berkeley, and um, the proceeds of the sale of those lots between Arlington and Berkeley was used to then build uh, the third street, uh, Clarendon, right, and so forth. Uh, this is the city acting as a developer, but normally it is a private firm or individual who will uh, subdivide the land. Um, and then the streets and the utilities and so forth are turned over to the public entity um, for maintenance. The, uh, the subdivisions like Inman Park, Druid Hills, Ansley Park, Brookwood Hills, and so forth, the early subdivisions in Atlanta were built exactly that way. Um, 
and then uh, the city is responsible for the maintenance of the streets, um, which you pay property taxes and so forth for. Um, so these streets and so forth have to be built to a particular standard, and that standard is set by the municipality under the provisions of the subdivision regulations which fall within the Standard City Planning Enabling Act. And uh, so this deals with uh, the acts of subdivision. Now, let me fast forward to the present and say that um, over the last, ever how many years it's been since 19, say 1930, what would that be, 83 years, uh, these issues of sort of, sub of constitution and representation to use the terms that I've coined for this course are hopelessly conflated, right? They, they become all mixed up and confused in everybody's mind to the point to such an extent that the city of Atlanta, as I mentioned, has actually zoned Piedmont Park, a public space, uh, has actually zoned it, which by definition um, doesn't make any sense by definition. They've even zoned freeway rights of way. You know, the, if you've got an exchange with a circular access ramp, the land in the middle of that circular access ramp will actually show up as a zoning category, you know, residential or commercial or something, which makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But um, that's how hopelessly confused these things have, have become. So I thought it would be useful for a brief moment to go back and look at Section 6 of the General Powers and Duties of the Standard City Planning Enabling Statute as it was passed out of Congress in 1928. Uh, in this case, the commission is the City Plan Commission, which uh, in the early days was uh, typically a citizen body that consisted of architects and landscape architects and city planners, um, lawyers, real estate developers, citizens, you know, activists, so forth, uh, who would then um, um, constitute this, uh, this commission. Today, this is typically the Bureau of Planning within city government, within municipal government. Um, so either way, uh, that's what commission is referring to. Uh, so their duty and function is, is to make and adopt a master plan for the physical development of the municipality, including any areas outside of its boundaries, which in their judgment bear relation to the planning of such a municipality. Well, that was a mistake, to put it kindly. I don't believe that the city of Decatur, Georgia, would take very kindly to the city of Atlanta um, making plans for how the city of Decatur should be developed. Right? Um, likewise, I don't think uh, the city of Atlanta would take kindly to the city of Sandy Springs uh, making plans for how Atlanta should be developed. Um, the people who are elected to serve on the Atlanta City Council are duly elected constitutional officers charged with uh, the making of laws, et cetera, and so on. And um, so this was a, a mistake. But let's look at what the elements of such a plan were in the original enabling statutes. Um, such a plan with its accompanying maps, plats, charts, and descriptive matter shall show the commission's recommendations for the development of the territory, including, among other things, the general location, character, and extent of streets, viaducts, subways, bridges, waterways, waterfronts, boulevards, parkways, playgrounds, squares, parks, aviation fields, and other public ways, grounds, and open spaces, the general location of public buildings and other public property, and the general location and extent of public utilities and terminals, whether publicly or privately owned or operated, and so forth. Um, also for the removal, relocation, widening, narrowing, vacating, abandoning, change of use or extension of any of the foregoing ways, grounds, open spaces, etc., as well as a zoning plan 
The idea being that you project out what the public parts of the municipality will be, and then you pass the zoning plan based upon the rational use of land, based upon the capacity of the streets and the sewers and so forth. Unfortunately, that is not how it has unfolded, and it has created um, a large mess, to put it in technical terms. It's a mess. Now, um, let's hold that in abeyance for the moment and continue on then with zoning. After the Necto case through World War II, there were very few, um, very few cases. Part of this may have had to do with the, the Great Depression. There was not a lot of development, real estate development going on in the 1930s. Um, there were a few cases. I've already mentioned the clothesline cases in Ohio. Um, and then one, which is actually fairly critical, McCarthy versus Manhattan Beach. Manhattan Beach is a um, incorporated town on the Pacific Ocean in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, it is to Los Angeles as, let's say, Decatur would be to Atlanta. Um, and under the boardwalk, down on the pier in Manhattan Beach, all these kids were, would congregate. Now, these are people that are probably at present old enough to be your great-grandparents if they're still alive, and they would get down there and drink beer and smoke cigarettes and fool around and do other things um, that uh, upset the general public. And so uh, Manhattan Beach uh, passed a zoning ordinance which actually uh, forbid the sale of any alcoholic beverages, uh, cigarettes, um, other kinds of things that were attracting uh, these youth uh, who were down under the pier um, carrying on. And um, the court ruled, in my opinion correctly, that this was not a valid use of zoning. The zoning could not be used as a surrogate for enforcement of other laws regardless of whether or not it was in the public interest, right? Yes, it may be in the public interest that these uh, young people are not down there carousing and, and drinking and doing all sorts of things. Um, however, uh, th that's not a zoning issue. If, uh, if the drinking age is 21, enforce the Open Container Act. Enforce the Drinking Age Act. Enforce the existing laws that... Um, that address the specific behavior, but you cannot use zoning as a surrogate uh, to solve some other kind of problem. This is really kind of an extension of the Necto case in a way, right? Um, in the application of the law, uh, zoning deals with land use, um, and it does not deal with um, as a surrogate for other laws, regardless of whether or not um, it was deemed in the public interest. Well, those were really the only two sort of um, major cases that came along until the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s when there was a, 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 a series, uh, almost rapid fire, 62, 74, 77, uh, so forth, 78, 79, um, that all involved 14th Amendment, that is, equal protection cases. Uh, 1962, uh, a suburb of Pittsburgh, duly incorporated, uh, passed a zoning ordinance in which they zoned every single thing in the town residential with a minimum lot size of four acres. A developer, joined by the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, sued. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, citing an invisible plaintiff, ruled that such zoning was exclusionary that is, that it violated the 14th Amendment rights of African Americans. Now, um, they did so on the grounds that uh, it froze forever uh, the possibility of a city to change and grow um, as it might um, actually need to do. And uh, as a result, uh, they incited then this invisible plaintiff um, 
And just to, to um, um, point this out, the developer was saying, you know, I, I mean, the, the, there's not a market. The market for a whole town full of four-acre lots does not, in fact, exist. Right? So um, with the NAACP joining the suit, it then kicked it immediately into a suspect category and a fundamental interest. And, um, and thus it was heard by, um, by uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, which overturned uh, East Town's zoning ordinance saying that you, 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 <laughs> you can't zone every single thing in the town one use. Just logic just dictates that that is uh, absurd, and that in fact it um, would violate potentially violate uh, future generations yet unborn who would not then be able to move into this town because they can't afford to buy four acres of land. Uh, let me point out here that there's a bit of of, of a convoluted um, sort of logic to this. Um, brilliant on the part of the attorneys. And that is that um, there is no constitutional guarantee to income. Nowhere. Um, they, um, there is a higher number in absolute numbers of uh, ethnic white people who are below the poverty line than ethnic black people. However, as a group, there is a higher percentage of African Americans below the poverty line, particularly in 1962, uh, than there are ethnic whites. And therefore, uh, it became then this uh, 14th Amendment equal protection issue. Following on that, in 1974, uh, Southern Burlington County NAACP versus the Township of Mount Laurel. Mount Laurel is a legally incorporated town in southern New Jersey, directly across the river. It's a suburb of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, the NAACP of southern Burlington County sued um, Mount Laurel uh, on the basis that Mount Laurel had done something similar. Uh, it wasn't quite as absurd as zoning everything four-acre lots, but it was something similar. What made this case particularly interesting is that the mayor of uh, Mount Laurel was African-American and a majority of the city council was African-American. And so the court in this case is ruling not on the intent to discriminate, but by the application of the law, again going back to NECTO, in the application of it, it was discriminatory because Mount Laurel as part of the Philadelphia metropolitan area, had a responsibility to provide its fair share of uh, different housing types for different um, income groups and so on and so forth. And then finally, in 1977, Arlington Heights versus the Metropolitan Housing Corporation. Um, this is a complicated case, and I think it's best if we just ignore it, to tell you the truth. Uh, however, I would encourage you to um, read this slide carefully because there will be test questions on this particular slide. So now um, I'm going to do what no teacher should ever do. I now have one thing in abeyance, that is the subdivision regulations. I'm going to ask you to hold a second thing in abeyance, which are these uh, equal protection cases, and um, I want to introduce a third element here, uh, which is called the American Association of Highway Transportation Officials, AASHTO. This is a voluntary association of all the state departments of transportation. All right. Um, they set the standards for street design in in, the, in what is known as the Green Book. And if you have $500 lying around, you can go online and buy it. There is a copy in our library. Uh, it's a manual for the geometric design of streets and highways and so forth. 
Um, and now we're going to come back here to Spring Street and Fifth Street. And if you are from China or Korea or France or anywhere else in the world, this is a reason why you should um, proceed cautiously and carefully when you sort of look to anything in the United States uh, as an example of how to do something. Because what we've created here is a total mess. Um, this street, West Peachtree, is a state highway. It was not built by the state. It was built by a private subdivision developer. But when the interstates were built, it connected one part of the interstate to another part of the interstate. And thus, the state took it over. And so state law and state DOT applies to West Peachtree and Spring Street. Okay. Um, Fifth Street, from this intersection to Spring Street, is owned by the city of Atlanta. Fifth Street from, um, hey Charles, Fifth Street from, um, from um, the George Tech Hotel to the freeway, the bridge across the interstate, is owned by the city of Atlanta. And then it crosses the right-of-way of the Interstate Highway, which is owned by the state of Georgia, built to AASHTO standards. So to get a common sidewalk at Tech Square took two years. Two years. Now, if you were a private developer um, trying to develop the Georgia Tech Hotel or this building or anything else on this property, you don't have two years. Your pockets aren't that deep. You can't sit on your loans for two years waiting on approval from the state and approval from the city. And the state and the city would never agree because they operate on two sets of standards. The Midtown Business Association, which created an organization called Midtown Alliance, had done a plan for Midtown in which they had developed a standard sidewalk, a standard curb cut for, for um, um, wheelchair access, et cetera. Uh, that's a standard uh, light fixture for the streets, et cetera. Uh, but the state did not recognize that. Included in the city's plan, or in the Midtown Alliance plan, which was adopted lock, stock, and barrel completely by the city of Atlanta, um, they just incorporated all the Midtown Alliance standards and guidelines into their public work standards. Um, the city streets could have on-street parking but the state said you cannot have on-street parking on a state highway, right? And that because this was designated under the AASHTO standards as um, a level one service road, it meant that you um, could only signal it every 1,800 feet. So you couldn't have stop signs. You couldn't have traffic lights every 1,800 feet. So the state and the city never could agree. Well, if Georgia Tech, which doesn't have particularly deep pockets, but which is not going to go anywhere, we're here for the long haul, had not been involved, um, then it is doubtful that we would have a standard sidewalk, um, the same sidewalk that we see on Fifth Street and the same sidewalk that we see on Spring or West Peach Street. We would have had, in fact, different standards. Um, in fact, the um, David Green, some of you may know, he is pr professor of practice. Uh, he's an architect, urban designer with Perkins and Will, professor of practice in the College of Architecture, working for a private client, developed this housing project called Mid-City Lofts over here. And they never could get a certificate of occupancy so that people could move into the building 
because of this problem between the city and the state. And um, ultimately, uh, Georgia Tech was able to break that logjam, and, um, and there was an agreement reached on the sidewalk details. But you understand that you're, you're moving from state to city to state to city to the state again, and then to a city street that runs through a state institution, Georgia Tech. However, where you have fraternities and sororities fronting onto that street, they are private entities, and that's private property. Okay? The state is not subject, Georgia Tech is not subject to zoning law. Now, it tries its best to conform to it because it doesn't want to have a headline in the Atlanta Journal Constitution saying Georgia Tech refuses to abide by city law. Right? Um, so they will do their best to abide by it. But um, in any event, uh, the developer over here, Kim King and Associates, of uh, this housing, you know, didn't have the same wherewithal that Georgia Tech has, and so they had a real problem there. And ultimately, um, it was, it was uh, resolved um, so that they could actually then get on-street parking on West Peachtree Street, which the state was not going to allow. Ashto has subsequently, in the last 10 years, um, developed, um, developed um, something called context-sensitive design because they have recognized that uh, if you're building sort of rural highways, level one service may mean something quite different than it does, um, you know, in the middle of midtown Atlanta. Um, they haven't gone far enough, but I wanted to mention this because it is in fact, in fact, I'll say here, Together with zoning and subdivision regulations, these standards are the most powerful agents of design of contemporary urban and suburban form in the United States today. And it's incredibly powerful. Um, I mentioned earlier carrot and stick. If you want to get uh, federal money for um, whatever it may be, the development of freeways or something, you have to conform to federal DOT standards and the federal DOT has adopted the AASHTO standards uh, as the standards, actually, that, um, that, um, that, um, that, we are, that we have to live with. So um, much of Stein and Wright's initial Radburn ideas were incorporated into these standards. They tend to favor uh, cul-de-sac streets. They tend to favor, in fact, the nomenclature of streets of local and collector and distributor and arterial, uh, every subdivision regulation of every municipality in the country has to use those terms. So if you think about that, the concept of a boulevard or the concept of a, of a parkway or the concept of, uh, uh, of an avenue does not fit within um, the, the, these standards. This doesn't fit. You know, is uh, Ponce de Leon, as it goes through Druid Hills toward Decatur, is that a collector, a distributor? You know, there's nothing within the classification nomenclature of Ashto that would allow a street to have any larger social, economic, or political purpose beyond the safe travel of automobiles and trucks, bicycles. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. It's not within their purview, right? Um, so, you know, I've had arguments with people, planning director of uh, Columbus, Georgia, um, who uh, I said, you know, this, these just gorgeous streets that extend through a 19th century, the downtown of Columbus extends these streets, same width, same right of way, extends into these residential zones. Uh, absolutely beautiful streets, marvelous neighborhoods, 
And um, I pointed out that under the subdivision regulations of um, whatever county that is, it's a consolidated city county government. Um, anyway, uh, that I could not build an avenue. He said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. He said, no, you can. You tell me what kind of street you want to build and you negotiate with me. And so my response to him was, so you're telling me that, that as a developer, as a property owner, my Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment rights depend upon uh, your willingness to agree with me. That is what the courts would say is an arbitrary and capricious use of police power. It's not the rule of an individual. It's the rule of law. So if I, if I have a standard that says I can only signal every 1,800 feet, I cannot stamp a drawing that has it signaled every 600 feet. Right? I'm, and I cannot knowingly violate the law. I lose my license. And um, he's still convinced he's right, I'm sure. Um, I hope he doesn't find out the hard way in a court that he is, in fact, wrong. So um, these, two, these two pages actually summarize, um, you know, what you will be responsible for um, on the test, okay? Zoning, that's, 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 that date is wrong. That should be uh, 19, 1926 right there. Um, I also think this, this um, from the Mount Laurel case, summarizes, um, summarizes the court's position in an extraordinary way. It's a, it's a liberal court, um, and it never was tested at any higher level, but um, the New Jersey Supreme Court, 1983, there were actually two cases. The first one said, look, Mount Laurel, you are responsible. Um, we're not questioning whether or not your, your intent is honorable and so on, but, um, but, but you are responsible for your fair share of a multiplicity of land uses and housing types uh, within the greater metropolitan Philadelphia area even though you're across the river in New Jersey, you're still part of the standard metropolitan statistical area of Philadelphia. And they wrote, it would be useful to remind ourselves that the doctrine does not arise from some theoretical analysis of our Constitution, but rather from underlying concepts of fundamental fairness in the exercise of governmental power. The basis for the constitutional obligation is simple. The state controls the use of land, all of the land. And exercising that control, it cannot favor rich over poor. It cannot legislatively set aside dilapidated housing in urban ghettos for the poor and decent housing elsewhere for everyone else. The government that controls the land represents everyone. Right? Everyone. Okay. Now, let's see how this sort of plays out. Uh, even in the absence of uh, equal protection issues, all right? Um, I love this slide. This was taken from the North Avenue Bridge. The varsity is on your left.